in the quietness of this place. Surrounded by the all-pervading presence of the Holy, my heart whispers, keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve, that in good times or in tempests, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Words by Howard Thurman. Welcome. Welcome to this place of worship. Welcome to this virtual worship. Wherever and whenever you are tuning in, you are very welcome to this time. My name is Bob Janice Dillon, and I'm honored to serve as minister at the Merseyside Unitarian Ministerial Partnership. And I serve at Cairo Street in Warrington, Matthew Henry in Chester. And today, I'm very delighted to bring you worship from a uh, congregation I'm honored, very honored to serve, Park Lane Chapel in Ashton and Naperfield. This chapel has been here since 1697, and it's seen quite a few people walk through these doors, and even though we're mostly empty here today, we're filled with the spirit, both of the generations and of the community, that is still Park Lane Chapel, that are near and far from this place, and united in love, in commitment, and in perseverance. People have come here over the years in, in times of tempest, as well as in good times. Come here with uh, joy, with assurance, with consolation, and they have made a beloved community here. And we gather here, virtually here, in the same spirit here today. I don't think I have a, any, a lot of announcements. I do want to say there is a conversation on race and in the Unitarian thing in a week from now. Um, and I know that's uh, kind of a scary topic for some, but um, it's going to be a well-facilitated conversation. So I would encourage you, it's online, on Zoom, and you can find out at the Unitarian website about that. That's going to be on the 25th of June, a Thursday night at 7 p.m. And the only other, other announcement is I know people are anxious to know about what's going to happen with, with chapels reopening gradually and what's happening with all that. We know we're in conversations and committees at the various chapels. We, we urgently want to keep everyone safe, and at the same time, we know that there's a, a desire to find ways to connect however we can, whether that be virtually or in person, or so all of those conversations are happening. Please feel free to give me a call or email if you have any concerns or questions or to talk things over, or just for a chat. That's what I'm here for, so I'd be delighted to hear from you. Oh, I also want to say this, this service is family-friendly. Um, there are a few... Maybe big words here or there, but most, most of us don't understand the big words, so don't worry. Um, if my stole gets messed up, your job is to yell uh, through the camera, your stole is wrong. I don't think that's a pantomime phrase, but you know, something like that. Your, your stole is crooked, um, and then I'll fix it if you yell really loud, so that'll make it interesting. And we do have a story for all ages in a moment, but first we'll begin with song. Uh, we're going to... Put the, the, the music and the words there on the screen so you can sing at home. This first song is one that's both in the red hymnals and the green hymnal. You, um, if, you, if you have a hymnal at home, and I know most people probably don't, but just so you know, it's, it's uh, 64 in the green hymnal or 1 in the red hymnal. If you've never sung it before, you'll get the hang of it, don't worry. It's all people that on earth do dwell. So let us sing together, all people that on earth do
Well, I promised you a story, and this story is called Noah's Granddaughters. You may know the beginning of this story, which is in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, um, and the end comes from imagination. So it began with a great rainstorm. It's actually raining now, but it started to rain, and it rained for ages and ages. And God said to Noah, you have to get a boat. So we did, and we built a boat. Thank you. you need a bigger boat. <laughs> well, he had a bigger boat. Just have to use your imagination. It was much bigger than this one. But he built a gigantic boat. And in fact, it was big enough for two of every animal. Two elephants and two giraffes and two dinosaurs. And, or each kind of dinosaur. And two of, two of everything except the fishes who have plenty of those in the water already. And the birds. But anyway, put two by two. And, more, and he had all his family come as well. And they all came on this gigantic boat. And then they went to the water. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. All day it rained, and then all night, and then all the next day, and then all the next night. And it just went on and on and on, and water covered the whole land. And so one day, they saw a bird with an olive branch, and they said, Oh, there must be land somewhere. And they kept going, and then they said, Land ho, there's land! And so, very excitedly, they all got out of the boat, and they got to land, and they were very, very happy. And God said, uh, that he wasn't going to flood the world ever again, and in fact he said he would make a rainbow, uh, uh, and, and as a reminder that every time after it rained, there'd be a rainbow to show that he wasn't going to submerge the whole earth, because that was a very difficult, traumatic time, and that from there, um, he would never flood the world again. Well, that's the beginning of the story. Noah's granddaughters came about later, but would you know, even though God had said that wasn't going to happen anymore and that the flooding was gone, people still got a little nervous every time it rained. Because you can imagine, that was such a hard time. 40 days and 40 nights, and they found it really challenging when it rained. And so, there were three granddaughters who were a bit scared of the rain. Even though they hadn't been on the boat, they still had this fear about, you know, what they heard the stories and they didn't want the whole world to be flooded. So, the first granddaughter loved to make, whenever they, it rained, she, was, she thought about her fort. She loved to make a big fort. And it didn't always last, because she made it out of cardboard, and it didn't always last the, even the end of the rainstorm, even a mild rainstorm. But she would try that. And the second daughter, well, she said, those forts are never going to last. She said, That's, those forts, they're, they're not strong enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig something under the earth. So she dug and dug and tried to build a tunnel. It was very ingenious, but she didn't get all that far. And then the third daughter, at first she went to go under the fort, and she huddled under the fort with her sister, which that didn't feel right. And then she tried to dig into the earth. And then the third daughter, she, when it started to rain, she actually went down to the beach, and she took a step into the water. And the next time it rained, well, she took two steps into the water. And finally, somebody saw her. Her name was Chaya. And I said, Chaya, what are you doing? Why are you going to the water? Next, she was up to her, her waist in the water. And she said, it's raining already. Why are you going in the beach? Why are you going? And she said, well, because I think I should learn how to swim. And that's the story. She, her response to uh, all this and to the possibility that it might rain so much for 40 days and 40 nights is to learn how to swim. And she did learn how to swim. Fortunately, it never flooded quite like it did before, but she became a very good swimmer. So that's our little story. And now, I would uh, like us to gather our hearts in prayer. If we, we would, um, let us pray together. We have a lot on our minds and our hearts, a lot for us to pray for. And let's just take a moment just to, just to be still. Know that God is God. Simply be in wherever you are. Be in this community, whether you're Park Laner or a Unitarian or a human being or whoever you are, you're very welcome here. Let us gather our hearts in stillness and in prayer. Spirit of life and love, creator of the soul.
come to you in worship and in prayer. We come to you with gratitude. Just as you brought Noah and Noah's family to safety, you bring us from day to day. Bring us safe from one day to the next, all the days of our life. Remember all those whose journey has ended, but are with you in glory. Remember, especially this week, Jack Hadwell, and we hold all his family in our prayers. As we hold in prayer the family of lost loved ones, Gareth and Jay, Daphne, Malcolm, Tony. And we know those names are just a few of the thousands who have lost their lives in these past terrible few months. We send out our prayers to all their friends and families to sustain them in this time of the valley of the shadow of death, to lead them and all of us towards healing and mercy. We pray for all those who are struggling in this difficult and unusual time. And all those who are lonely. All those who are anxious. Pray for all those with concerns about how and when to be there for others, whether it be the faith communities of every faith, the businesses, the schools, and we're keeping our prayers, the hospitals and the care homes and the people there who have been working together to build the beloved community in the most difficult of circumstances. This is an unusual time. But we keep in prayer for those too who suffer injustice throughout their lives. And there be those who are denied a promotion for gender or race, those who are treated differently in so many different ways, the color of their skin, those for whom poverty is a daily challenge, those who struggle to put food on the table throughout the world and even here in the United Kingdom. We think especially of the children who struggle with poverty. And we give thanks for the voices of those, including Marcus Rashford, and all those who have spoken up for children, and who help to feed and clothe those who have the least. We know that life is challenging, but we know that it's difficult. We know that it separates us at times. And yet, may we always remember you have brought us this far. Remind us, O oh Lord, of our moments of high resolve. You have brought us this far. We are fortunate to be here. And now is the time for us to be the hands and feet of your love, the voice of your justice. Now is the time for us to be the beloved community, not waiting for some imagined time, but to be kindness and mercy and compassion and generosity one another now. You have planted the rainbow over the world. You have reminded us that there is always blessings if we look for them. May we look for those blessings as so far as we are able. May we be them. Amen. I invite us, if you wish, to join in the prayer that Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So now we'll have just a minute or two of silent contemplation. 
chance to simply be there with our own thoughts and concerns and struggles. Be there with God, with the mystery, with love. And simply just be present to our own hearts, to our own spirits. So let us take a minute now to simply uh, observe the sounds. I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. That's from the letter to the Romans, chapter 15. Well, here we are. And as I say, I'm delighted to welcome you to Park Lane Chapel, which I'm sure some of you have never been in before, so you're very welcome. And when times are better, I hope you'll visit in person. This place was built in 1697, and these walls have seen a lot. This hat peg is from Thomas Blinston, who was uh, the minister in 1697, and uh, hung his hat on there. So it's been, his pulpit has been here through all that time, too. And I assume it's probably seen its fair amount of epidemics, because especially in the centuries before, disease was something that was very much a fact of life, and that's not to say it was a casual fact of life, because people um, did think about it a lot, and it was, it was part of life. So times like this have happened, though it probably hasn't seen quite an empty chapel all that often. And I know this is a difficult time. I don't want to generalize and say that if we go through these times, because it is a very hard time. And I think now we're in week 13, 12, something like that, I've lost track. Um, I think it can be an especially hard time. I think people's uh, tempers are getting frayed. People who are, uh, perform admirably and stoically in the first few weeks, I think that's so many of us um, have maybe uh, done, uh, spoken in ways we've regretted here and there, or just been found we've been out of energy, or found ourselves bewildered, or those of us who are used to being strong maybe have found ourselves not so strong. It's been a hard time. And perhaps as the most, uh, most strongest sign of that, that this has been a hard time, I've heard through the local grapevine where I live that people have been giving the ice cream man a hard time. The ice cream man. I mean, it takes a lot. Here's somebody who goes round and round spreading joy and spreading and getting and, sh and sharing ice creams and doing all the necessary social distancing and because we partake of the ice cream man, so I would say he's taking every available precaution. And uh, people have been short with him, I've heard, which I think is deeply unfortunate. But it's been hard on us all. I know it's been a, a hard time, and even those of us who have found many blessings, and many of us have the time, perhaps, to uh, be in the garden, or do jigsaw puzzles, or read, or simply to kind of slow down the pace of life. Many of us who have found blessings, it's still been hard. We are in a different place now, just in terms of the facts, and that's a good thing. Infections have gone down. Um, the number of people who have, as the phrase goes, sadly died, and it's such a tragedy when any one of those people dies, and to think that it's thousands and thousands, it's just hard to comprehend. But those numbers, thank God, are slightly lower now, getting lower in each week. 
I do believe we've made the right decision to go into lockdown. It's something we needed to do. But it's been hard. Being separated from one another. It's been hard in so many ways. And we're not where we want to be. You know, we had hoped when we went into this that we'd come out and sort of see the other side of it, right? But we knew, we were told that the vaccine was a long way away. So we knew that life wasn't going to be completely the same. Even so, when we're now, it's kind of a challenging time. It's not the same to you as it was. And so in a way, we're all like that girl Chaya in the story. We're learning to swim in new waters. We're learning how to be in these new times. We don't know how long they're going to last. Maybe at some point a vaccine will be found and things will be changed. But for a long time, we're going to have to learn to swim. Now when I say that, I'm not advocating in terms of relaxing all the social restrictions when the, the coronavirus is still running rampant. Personally, I worry about if we lower the six feet distance to three feet, that we'll probably make it two feet or one feet, and then we'll be far too close physically to one another to... Um, prevent the spread of this disease. But I'm not here to talk about the details. I know we've had so many disagreements about the details. I'm thinking about that line from um, the book of Matthew where Jesus says, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And I've been thinking about how hard it is to find agreement. Because we've been disagreeing quite a lot lately, right? And loudly. On social media, we've been disagreeing about social distancing and the efficacy of masks and public transport and what we should open and when and how the government's response and what has worked and what, what hasn't. And then just as we were in the midst of that, we've opened up a new argument about the injustices, racial injustices, as well as other injustices that have gone on for hundreds of years. And we said, well, is now the right time? But then, of course, when is it? We've argued about statues and history and heritage. We've all done our share of arguing. Maybe not all of us, but many of us. I know I have. And it's not quite enough to say, well, we'll agree to disagree. We should be tolerant of one another. Because so many of these are so important. I mean, it's life or death. You know, these are, these are really important issues about. We don't really have all the information. We don't know how effective social distancing is, how and when and how and what situations things are spread more, spread less. We know the general outlines, but we don't really know. We're still trying to come up with the science. But when we have these difficult times to agree, to get two or three people to agree, nowadays feels harder than it ever has been. And yet this is where we are in this funny in-between time. When you're arguing about what is to come, and we're still not comfortable with where we are. We're happy that things have gotten a bit better, but then we grieve for those who have lost their lives and the families who are mourning. We're in this funny in-between time. The Bible deals a lot with the not yet. We heard about Noah, the not yet was 40 days and 40 nights, which was supposed to signify a long time, right? It was supposed to feel like forever. Well, we've been can't do the math now, what are the 85 days? So 40 days is nothing. But in the Bible, 40 days and 40 nights is a long time. But to say a really long time, Moses was in the desert, according to the story, for 40 years. So that's a really long time. For 40 years, the Jewish people were not yet the Jewish people, and they were waiting to find a promised land, the land of milk and honey, for 40 years of feeling not there yet. And then they get there, but much of the Bible is written when they're in exile. They get to the promised land, and then they get kicked out. And so they spend years in Babylon waiting to be in the promised land to return. And they still feel that sense of not yet. And then in our Christian tradition, Jesus continues the story because Jesus lives in the not yet. They're waiting for Jesus to be a Messiah, to save the world, to, to make the world, to redeem it. And he does, in a way. And yet not in the way we expect it. The not yet still holds true throughout his whole life. At the end of his life, and they're waiting for some grand finale while well, he dies. And he dies in a terrible way with everyone watching. And so this promised land, this result that we're waiting for, is not yet accomplished. Not in his own lifetime. 
And when it is accomplished is an interesting question. Is it accomplished the first time he appears? Is it accomplished when the apostles all gather together? Is it accomplished when Christianity is officially founded, whenever that is? Or is it not yet accomplished? Are we not yet in the promised land? Are we not yet where we want to be? Are we still waiting for that land of milk and honey, that land of justice and equality? We live a lot of times in the not yet. But we also have to be where we are. This is, this is where we are. And it can be quite a beautiful time. There are many blessings, I'm sure you found, in the midst of your day. So it's all very well to acknowledge the not yet quality of our lives. And there is something not yet. We won't, you know, I don't think this time of coronavirus will last forever in human history. And yet, this is where we are. There's something to say. This is where we are. I think it's dangerous to think, look too far. It's it, not to look, it's not that I think it's good to look into the future, but it's dangerous to not live where we are now. Sometimes, I know, thinking about online and social media, we feel like it's not real. And I think sometimes, sometimes the conversation on there can get, I'm not opposed to it being heated. But sometimes it can be like people aren't taking it seriously, like we're saying things just to wound somebody else without treating them as another human being. And so I think we need to remind ourselves, wherever we are on the political spectrum, religious spectrum, that when we're online, we're really there. I mean, it's virtual, it's a strange environment, but that's really where we are. We really are interacting with other real people. And that sounds really obvious, but I think we can lose track of it. So let's remember that even as we live the not yet, we are here now. This is real. This is our lives right now. And we have to learn to swim in this time. And of course, it's reminding us of things that have always been true. Life has always been precarious. And we know that. Sometimes we shove it to the side. There are always risks to life. And we know that. But sometimes we forget. Well, we're strongly aware of that now. We're learning to swim in these difficult times. And even when we discover a cure for coronavirus, it's not going to change those fundamental facts of existence. We're still going to be in times where life is uncertain. And the more we can learn to swim, the lessons we learn now can help us to live fully and happily and deeply and with respect for one another and for justice in this new future. So we can learn some really important lessons now. You may know the phrase that Gandhi says, I think it's always so great to remind, remind us of this, be the change you hope to see in the world. Be the change you hope to see in the world. Yes, it's the not yet time. But now is the time to live the way we want the world to be. Right now is the time to live the way we want the world to be. Or as Paul put it in that letter I said at the beginning, I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct that we are able to instruct one another. We can be teachers of one another, which doesn't mean that we have to be perfectly learned or anything like that. All of us have something to instruct one another. All of us can learn together. And Paul says that. I find it interesting that the next word is nevertheless, and then he explains all the things that they should be doing. So even Paul doesn't always trust in the people. But I think it's important that we do, and I do trust in you, that you have the knowledge that you need to live a loving life. That you can be a teacher for someone else, that you have a lesson to teach someone else, and that we can learn from one another. And as Jesus says in Matthew, two or three of us can agree, and God will be there amongst us when we agree. Now by agree, I don't mean we agree on every particular. We're not going to agree on, on all the different things that we come to say about. And I don't think we should. I think diversity is important. And we're different people. I looked up that word agree in the book of Matthew, and it's sophona, which is to voice together, to be of the same voice. And it's the same word as symphony. So in a symphony, some notes are bass notes, and some are high notes, and some are loud, and some are soft. And just like that, all of our pe people are like that. Some of us are, have a prophetic voice, and we have a loud and strident voice, and maybe we should. And some of us have a more gentle voice and a more presence. 
uh, a more of a pastoral presence to one another. I'm not asking you to be who you want. I don't think that serves any one of us. I'm asking you to be fully yourself. Let us together learn how to swim. Learn how to agree. Which doesn't mean say exactly the same thing, but to create a symphony together. To be present to one another in our differences and be here now so that together we can make a beautiful symphony together. Now is the time that we have to remake the world. Tikkun Olam is the Hebrew phrase. Remake the world. It's a broken world, but we can make it an even better world than it ever was. Let's do it now. And for goodness sake, be nice to the ice cream. So now I invite us to sing our second hymn, which I put over here. Let us sing our closing hymn together. And again, it's in the red book and in the green book. It's number 208 in the green hymnal, 232 in the red hymnal. A hymn about shriving forward into the future together, forward through the ages. Let us sing.
We're getting there, friends. We're on the way. And, at the same time, we're already here. We're here in this glorious day. This is the life of life now. We get to live this marvelous day. We get to live out the kindness and the mercy and the justice and the love of God in our actions. So may we make the most of this day and create a glory here on our time on this beautiful day. God bless you.